Okay, good evening, church. Good evening. Welcome to Bible Study 8 out of 9. Today we're going to talk about a little story known as Sodom and Gomorrah. So, um, I could warn you again that this is going to be quite the adult version of Bible study. Um, this is maybe, well, probably not maybe, the most adult of the Bible studies that we will be going through. Um, you're going to see Sodom and Gomorrah probably in a way that you've not heard it before. Um, there are not a lot of times where we actually talk about what this story says. We talk about what we think it says, which is probably pretty far off base. So, uh, I'm really excited to bring this to you, and we're of course still asking the question, does God have a temper? We talked about that a little bit last week with Noah and the flood, and indeed last week we also talked about how Sodom and Gomorrah and Noah and the flood are really very similar stories, where everyone dies except for one chosen family, uh, where everyone else is wiped out by God, except for one family. And we see that story uh, happening here again in Genesis chapter 19, and we're going to parallel it to a, another story that you may have never, ever heard in your life in Judges 19. So Genesis 19 and Judges 19. We're going to talk about those two stories in parallel, and you're going to see some interesting similarities there. Okay, now, whenever you talk about Sodom and Gomorrah, there are layers upon layers upon layers because there is a story, and we're going to use the word story very heavily, about Sodom and Gomorrah. There's no archaeological evidence that any places called Sodom or Gomorrah ever lived, to which pundits would say, that's because God wiped them off the map, to which a historian would say, well, yeah, but there would have been some record of them, something written down about them before this, about how they had trade deals, about how they worshipped this god or this king, something would have surfaced if they were considered to be historical cities. They're not mentioned at all until post-Babylonian captivity. Nobody writes these names, nobody thinks of these names until after the Jewish people have already been around for over 150 years and after they've gone into captivity in Babylon around 587. Only after that when the Bible, the Hebrew Bible start to put together, do we ever hear these words. Now the problem with that is when you say that to people, they say, well yeah, but isn't it mentioned in Ezekiel? Isn't it mentioned in Matthew and in Luke? Sodom and Gomorrah is mentioned in lots of places, and that is true. Sodom and Gomorrah show up in very many parts of other scriptures, okay? But it shows up as a warning story. It's a story of warning. Remember, don't be like them. Don't be like them. And uh, here in Ezekiel, which is a really fascinating book that we ought to study sometime, you see this. And Ezekiel is talking, of course, about the city of Jerusalem when he says, As surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, your sister Sodom and her daughters never did what you and your daughters have done. Now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant overfed and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and the needy. They were haughty and did detestable things before me. Therefore, I did away with them as you have seen. First of all, have you ever heard the word haughty when it didn't reference the Bible? Does anybody else ever use that word? Maybe we should bring haughty back uh, as, a, as a word in our vocabulary, but it seems to only show up in Scripture you see, can you see how this is an editorial of an old story, okay? Can you see that? Yes? yes. Yeah. yeah, so Ezekiel is saying Sodom and Gomorrah's problem was blank. And it's not what you usually think Sodom and Gomorrah's problem is, is it? Ezekiel says that it is because they were overfed and unconcerned. Now, unconcerned is not something that we typically associate with 
Sodom and Gomorrah. That their problem was that they were arrogant. That's not something we typically ascribe to Sodom and Gomorrah. But Ezekiel is using, repurposing an old story to get a new message across. Honey child, you think that Sodom and Gomorrah were bad? You don't even know that you are worse. That's what Ezekiel is saying. This is what we would call hyperbole, right? This is exaggerated metaphorical language to get Jerusalem and its people and its daughters to act right. We use negative stories in order to get positive results out of other people. That's a natural human inclination. We exaggerate the past in order to prepare us to better experience the present. It's a fairy tale, yeah. It's a myth, it's a legend, it's a tall tale. And, and this one, I, I think in Ezekiel, shows how far we've taken a basic story and we've added on to it over and over again. Does anybody know the story of Pyramus and Thisbe? Does anybody know the story of Romeo and Juliet? What if I told you that Romeo and Juliet was nothing other than a reshaping of a Greek tragedy called Pyramus and Thisbe? How many of you knew that? Oh, somebody knows that, surely. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dolly does. What? You taught English. Yeah. Yeah, so Pyramus and Thisbe and, and uh, Romeo and Juliet are the same story, but we've taken an old story and we've repackaged it in order to tell a new story. And Scripture does that all over again. That's, that's how we stand on the shoulders of those who came before us in order to prepare the way for those who come after us. And Ezekiel knows that. And Ezekiel does just that. And prophetic literature does that an awful lot. And really great preachers sometimes do it too. Uh, we'll talk about uh, Dr. King uh, sometime and how he uses these things. So the thesis of today's class is that Sodom and Gomorrah should be read as a warning story. It's a watch out because bad things will happen. And the question is, how will you respond when bad things come to your door? Which is a story about preparation. Now, uh, we have a lot to cover today, so I'm briefly going to summarize the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. I think that you've heard it a lot before, a lot, get it? That was a joke. Before, before the destruction that happens in 19, these three men who represent the divine somehow, there's an interesting trinity showing up there in chapter 18, they come and Abraham sees them walking along and Abraham offers them hospitality. He says, why don't you come in and rest your feet and, and I'll, I'll make you uh, clean and my wife will cook something up. And then he goes and says, honey, do we have anything? We got company, right? And then she cooks something and they spend time and then the Lord says to them, now this is really interesting theologically because this is not why we usually the way we usually talk about Sodom and Gomorrah. We usually talk about Sodom and Gomorrah as God's anger. God is angry at the people. But look at clearly what it says. Just one chapter earlier than that. The Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great that their sin is so grievous that I will go down and see if what ha they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. Now, is that just an angry God? Nope. No. That's a God who works in customer service. <laughs> That's a God who has listened to the outcries of the people. Do you see how that's vastly different from just God got angry? You see how this isn't Deus Iri? This isn't even an, omniscient, an, an, an omnipotent God. This God doesn't actually know what's going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember we talked about J and P? We talked about how the J, Yahweh, a source, had a God who walked and talked amongst us. And that is the same God that shows up here. This is very much a J version of God. Um, I'm going to tell you, Abraham, that I've heard that things are going really bad. There's an outcry. 
And when people cry to me, I feel like I need to step up and do something. That's very different language from God looked down from on high and got mad and sent sulfur. Do you see that? Yeah? Yep. Okay, good. And Abraham stood before them. They were about to go, the, the three of them were about to go on their way down to Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham stands in front of them and says, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Now, what is Abraham doing? Who is he defending? Lot and his, and his people. And hopefully there's some others, right? And, and later in the story, we hear that Lot has daughters, and we hear that Lot's daughters have boyfriends, right? And, and he's trying to save all of those people. But Abraham is standing up for the people. And God is sent down to be the judge of the people. But God is not the prosecutor, the prosecutor are those who have brought their outcries before God. Okay, in the Jewish system, uh, lawyer language and trial metaphors matter. Okay, they matter a lot. And where you see God in that matters a lot. You see God here as a judge and not the prosecutor. But the way that we were all taught the story of God, Sodom and Gomorrah was that God was the prosecutor. Do you see how that's wrong? Yeah. You see how we've gotten that story a little mixed up. And then Abraham puts himself in the way. And he says, but what if you find somebody who's righteous, say 50? And God says, okay, if there's 50 people who are righteous, I won't. Well, what about 40? Okay, if there's 40, then I won't destroy the city. Well, what about, right, do you, you remember that whole, that happens right after this. Okay, so that's on the way down. So it's interesting that we've got sort of what we would call a devil's advocate which was a, a permanent a person on their council. There was always somebody on their council who uh, objected to whatever was going on, who always tried to poke holes into everything else that was happening in the council meeting, okay? There was always a naysayer on the council. There was always a no vote, right? Uh, and you see how that could be really helpful on a council? We've got Herman, so we don't really have to worry about that. I'm kidding. I'm kidding, Herman. That's a joke. It's a, uh, he says he's willing to do it. No, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important job. It's an important job because uh, sometimes those questions need to be raised, and that was an important role. In fact, that's exactly what's happening in the story of, jo of Job, right? Where God, uh, God says, have you considered my servant Job? Right? There's sort of that, anyway, there, there's a whole divine counsel uh, thing happening here. And, and that shows up. So Abraham s situates himself in the path of destruction and says, but what if you find some good people? Remember, we talked last week about good strawberries and bad strawberries, right? And if you have a batch and some of them have gone bad, it's probably better to throw the whole thing away, but God never does. God finds some good fruit even in the midst of the bad. And that same question happens here that really that happened in the Noah story. Is there anybody worth saving? Are there any good strawberries left? So some people who have studied this suggest that maybe, let's say there was a small, small towns. Okay, we know they can't be big cities because there's no historical evidence that suggests that they existed at all. But we're willing to accept that the idea that Sodom and Gomorrah could very well have been fishing villages that we've never heard of that uh, only have uh, 50 people in each of them or something like that. Okay, and what if a natural disaster befell them, which is completely likely. Okay, that's something good that could happen. Uh, we know that there's a fault line that goes through there. There could be earthquakes, and sometimes when there's earthquakes, uh, maybe there's some lava flow, maybe there's something weird that happened. Okay, maybe a bunch of people were actually destroyed. And it led people to ask the question that we asked throughout all of the ages. Why do bad things happen to whom? Good people. Which is a loaded question because it assumes that there's good people. Right? Uh, but we're good and bad. We're saints and sinners. It also assumes that there are bad things. Right? Uh, which is a loaded question in a lot of ways. Are, are, are some things good and some things bad? Are some people good or some people bad? Uh, that becomes a loaded question. But whenever it comes down to destruction, people often ask, is God mad at me? 
Does God have a temper? Is God angry? Um, I'm just going to cut to the chase on this. I think this is really bad theology. Uh, I actually wrote up here that it's the worst theology. To, say, to look at something bad that has happened and think, well, God must have been bad, mad at them. Um, and I'm sad to say, this theology has not gone away in 2,000 years' time, which is embarrassing Right? I keep joking with you all that we need to upgrade our software from the 1500s. This software is 2,000 years old. Right? There, this, is, uh, this software has, is so old that it matches the software of the organ in the traditional space. <laughs> That's how old the software is that has to be updated here. Um, and it still happens. And, and this just happened recently. Pastor Ann Graham, God let 9-11 happen because of transgender people in bathrooms. One of the most celebrated biblical people in North Carolina history, not one of, the most. Right? This is the daughter, right? She's the daughter of Billy Graham. And she utters this complete and utter horse manure. It's completely terrible. It's wrong in every way, shape, and form. Nobody was even talking about transgender bathrooms back in 2001. That wasn't even the debate at the time du jour. The idea that God let some people fly planes into other buildings in a state that's 900 miles away or 500 miles away uh, because of a bathroom bill in North Carolina is so absurd. And yet we live in a world where this theology finds a foothold. Remember when Hurricane Katrina happened? There were pastors, pastors, spreading this horse manure around. And I just feel like somewhere, uh, somebody, some pastors need to stand up and say, this is horse manure, right? This is absolutely the worst theology. And I don't want any of y'all walking around with it. I don't think that you do. But just in case you were thinking about thinking about this, uh, I wanted to go ahead and, and tell you this version is not uh, what we find in a loving and forgiving God. Um, yeah, that's, uh, it still happens. And uh, I hope that some of this class has helped give you some language to talk through that uh, with people that you might meet who might need to hear something new um, and who, uh, who've been listening to this woman with her uh, fake tan uh, and her crazy ideas. Okay, Sodom and Gomorrah is not a good story to talk about if what you really want to talk about is same-sex relationships. Remember the Ezekiel passage? It didn't even touch sexuality. It framed Sodom and Gomorrah as about gluttony and about haughtiness and about arrogance. Do you remember that? That was just five minutes ago. Yeah. yeah. So we remember that Ezekiel had this whole idea of Sodom and Gomorrah that had nothing to do with sexuality whatsoever. Um, and it, it's not something that should be brought up with in terms of same-sex relationships because it's not consensual, it's not relation-based, it's, it's about non-consent, not consent. There's a very big difference between non-consent and consent. Uh, I know your news feeds are full of a lot of really weird uh, sexual admissions these days, and I hope that you know there's a big difference between consent and non-consent. Do you know that there's a big difference between those two? Okay, great. So um, just really quickly, uh, we'll see that this is what Lot says to them. They called to Lot. We are the men who came to you tonight. Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them. Does that imply consent? Nope. No. no. That's not a loving and nurturing relationship. These are not two people who uh, have locked eyes in a room and have decided that they want to spend their lives together. Uh, this is about rape. This is about non-consent. 
So the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, quickly, is that those angels that were talking to Abraham, they walk down to Sodom and Gomorrah, and they find themselves in the square, and I want you to remember that. They start out in the square of the city, because that's going to come up again later. And, and there at the temple gates, that's where Lot finds them, and he says, oh, you need to come home with me. And they say, no, we'll just sleep in the square. We'll be safe. It'll be fine. We'll stay in the square tonight. We want to see the city. And Lot says, no, I won't take no for an answer. You have to come home with me. And Lot shows those angels the same hospitality that Abraham showed them. Do you see that that story parallels again? And it's at that house that these men show up and say, where are those men who came with you? Send them outside because we want to have sex with them. All right, that's where we are in the story. Is this an odd story? Yes. It's a very odd story. Um, it is not about same-sex relationships. Attempted non-consensual rape of angels does not belong in a conversation about same-sex relationships. I don't think I can make that font any bigger. <laughs> <laughs> but I hope that you understand what I'm saying here, okay? The attempted non-consensual rape of angels does not belong in a same-sex loving couple relationship conversation. Okay, so what I'm suggesting to you <laughs> is that the story of Sodom and Gomorrah is really more closely related to an understanding of zombie culture. Okay, how many of you like movies and TV shows about zombies? All right, just a couple of us. I was hoping there'd be more than that. Well, okay, well, uh, I tried not to put too much of it in here, but uh, I think it's a good parallel to what's happening here, okay? Listen to these next few words that happen right after that. Send, these, send the men outside that we might have sex with them, okay? These are men who have lost all self-control. That's what the story is trying to tell you, all right? Now listen to these next words and imagine that it's in a zombie movie. We'll come back to that. Get out of our way, they replied. This fellow came here as a foreigner, and now he wants to play the judge. We'll treat you worse than them. That's what happens uh, when Lot says, uh, I'm not sending them to you. They kept bringing pressure on Lot and moved forward to what? Break down the door. But the men inside reached out at the last second. And they pulled Lot inside the house and shut the door. See, that's a little bit of a zombie movie feel to it. Yeah, so I put this picture up there. So the two big ones on the side are actually pictures of artwork that have to do with Sodom and Gomorrah throughout time. The one on top is, of course, from the Thriller video, because how can you talk about zombies without talking about Thriller? And uh, the one on bottom is from today's representation, which is the great series known as The Walking Dead, uh, which is really fantastic. I got another picture though. But can you see how there's some zombie similarities here? Say yes. yes. You see how this kind of looks like a zombie apocalypse that's happening here. Uh, and so does this one, right? Lot's trying to make sense to them, uh, talk sense into them, and the angel's like pulling them back in right at the last second, right before the zombies chomp on him. And I think that's a good way for us to understand this story because these are not reasonable people. Sure, they've still got some language, they've still got motor skills, but other than that, they are truly zombies. They cannot be reasoned with. They do not have reasonable expectations of what's about to happen. They're not looking for good relationships. They, they have lost their minds. They might as well be zombies. And in a world where so much chaos happens, men acting like uncontrollable beasts is the fear of all fears in the ancient world. You see, not long ago, all of these people were nomadic. They didn't spend time together, and then somebody taught them how to become agrarian, how to set up farms, and how to raise families, and how to, 
how to learn things and then they started living closer together but when they lived closer together there were more people and when there are more people there is then more crime there's more problems that can happen uh, out of that and when you get a whole bunch of people together the time that you're most vulnerable is when the sun goes down at night and they've got these laws but they can't always quite enforce them there's no police force out it's just a, the law of the land and every now and then somebody brings in wine or something like that and and people go off the deep end and their caveman brain comes out and they just take whatever they want and only the strong survive and the big men who come back from war who almost died that day they decide that they can just do whatever they want because they are the big man on campus do you see how for a fledgling city this is a real life zombie apocalypse this is what your worst fears are. And no matter how well you built your shanty of a house, a big man can come and break it down. And you will always sleep with one eye open. And if you have daughters, you will worry about them every single day and night of your life. Now, we as dads worry about our daughters, obviously, but nothing like this, okay? And it gets so bad that his basic instinct, which is to protect his family, he, he goes against that, okay? So this next part is supposed to be jarring. I think you're supposed to look at this and say, wow, this is really not okay. By the way, this is also a picture of The Walking Dead. Uh, great show, really. Y'all need, need to see it. Um, but you can see the fear here. The fear here is that everyone is going to give up on their higher cognitive function and resort back to their animalistic instinct to just take whatever it is that they want. And, and the more people there are around, the more likely that seems that it will happen. <laughs> so to, to end, round out that story real quick, the, the end of what happens there uh, is that the angels finally take Lot, who's, who's just totally shocked about the whole thing. He, he's sort of paralyzed in fear, and they literally take him out of the town with his wife and his two daughters. And then what happens? His wife famously does what? She looks back and turns into what? Okay, so this is a great story, right? It's a great story because uh, near the, the Dead Sea, there are these things that look like people, and they're actually pillars of salt. And so if you happen upon uh, something there that looked like a person, looks like the shape of a person, you might start telling somebody that that's the story of somebody who turned into a pillar of salt, and then later you hear the Sodom and Gomorrah story, and bam -oh, we've added the pillar of salt story to the end of the Sodom and Gomorrah story. You see how that's a really natural way to tell the story? Yeah, we do that all the time. Yeah. Uh, you ever read Hansel and Gretel and then gone to see a Disney movie? <laughs> yeah. Stuff changes. Or, sorry, Brothers Grimm, and then got to see a Disney movie, right? Yeah. Stuff, stuff changes, yeah. We change the endings to stuff all the time. This isn't new to us, um, but, but I thought that was, you know, worth mentioning because that's probably where the story comes from. That makes total sense to me. Now, the part that I've glossed over in all this is what? The daughters. daughters. And what happens to Lot's daughters But before? We t last week, we talked about what happens after with yeah. Lot's daughters. Okay, so Lot offers his daughters to the zombies yes. and says what? You can't have these men, but here, have my two virgin daughters. Uh, the text actually says that they've never known a man, right? It's biblical knowing again, just like uh, back in Genesis chapter 2 and 3. That's right, you see, we're layering. Well, they've never known a man. Take my daughters. And you would think that the crowd of zombies would take the flesh. But what do they say? Nope. Nope. We want those men. And if you don't give them to them lot, give them to us lot, we will treat you what? Worse than them, you foreigner. You see how that's their worst fears? 
let alone that rape, especially male-on-male -male rape, is, would be something so terrifying. It would be the most uh, subjectifying, it would be the most uh, effeminizing thing that a heterosexual man could imagine happening, right? This is the, this is the prison scenario, right, uh, that, that we talk about often in our culture. Um, whether or not that's true, it's, it's sort of a slang thing that we say. But you, can you imagine how the idea that the strongest man uh, is always the alpha male and that he could not only come into your house and take your daughters, but he could also rape you is probably a real fear. It's probably not just an imagined one. That's probably happened to someone around. And you can see how that just gets really to the heart of their biggest fears in this world. And, and so the idea that they, these people would turn on you, they would all become sort of like zombies, and they would come to your house, and you would try and reason with them by giving them your daughters, which is, is already telling you how far Lot has been pushed. That he's willing to give up his own, the closest thing to him other than his actual self. Right? In sort of a 1984 turning on your loved ones kind of way. He's willing to give away his own daughters to preserve his self. And as soon as he does that, they suggest not only will they take the men that you're harboring, but then they will do what to you? Worse. Worse. And then they call him a foreigner. As if to say that when the sun was up, they were all citizens of the same town. And when the sun went down, you are no longer considered one of them. You are the outsider. You are the foreigner. You are the illegal alien. That is his worst fear come to life. And so when the angels then save him and say, are there other people that we need to get out of the city? And Lot, you have to go. Lot stalls. And I think that really gets to the, just the fear of, uh, of being paralyzed by fear for Lot. He can't even move until the angels finally get him out. And, and he spends the rest of his days um, really not in charge of his own life. He's been broken as a human being. So these are the words that happen in the middle of that story. Lot went outside to meet them and shut the door behind him and said, No, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters who have never known a man. Let me bring them out to you and you can do what you like with them. But don't do anything to these men. For they have come under the protection of my roof. Now you know the feminist in me, we're going to deal with this. <laughs> but first let me just point out again that this is always a story about hospitality. This is always a story about how we need to uh, come together and we need to follow our laws, not just in the daytime, but in the nighttime also. When things get scarier, we need to stand up for what is right. And it seems a little odd that he would give up his daughters, I think, until you realize that it really is that scenario where he is only trying to survive for himself. Uh, and whether we could um, successfully become altruistic in that scenario uh, is not really a question that we can answer hypothetically to be honest with you, whether or not we can sacrifice ourselves even for our loved ones in that scenario is really tough. But it does seem odd to me as a feminist that he's willing to protect the men under his roof because he's promised them to protect them. But hasn't he also promised his daughters that he would protect them? Was he raising them as pristine virgins only to send them out to the slaughter like this? seems uh, not just an offensive story to us, but seems like a really sad story, too. A really sad place in his life. <clears throat> oh, 
Sodom and Gomorrah is really a story about extending hospitality to foreigners. It's really a story about how do we grow not only in numbers as a city, because really the, the more people that are together, the more organized it can be, and the more taxes and the more roads, the more, the more, the, the better the society can be when you get a bunch of people together. But how can we instill <coughs> law and the way that we'll have more people come is if we have a good society. If we're just, if we have rules, and then we follow the rules and we keep those things going. And hospitality becomes a really big theme in this prehistory. Because what's the history story? If this is prehistory, what's the first story of the Hebrew Bible? If this is the pre-story? Exodus. The Exodus. Yeah. So they were in captivity. And then they go to the land of milk and honey, which those things don't actually grow on land, right? <laughs> milk and honey suggest civilization, right. right? The land of milk and honey suggests that there are already people living there. And so the very first story of the Hebrew people is the one about how other people showed them hospitality. See how that would become really important to them? Because they were foreigners just like all of us were, right? And we can talk about Thanksgiving <laughs> uh, in a historical sense too, uh, but on its basic level, it was someone else being hospitable to us, at least for a day, right? At least for a feast. There's a parallel story to this one. And I'm guessing most of you have never read before in your entire lives. Uh, but it is uh, dis disturbing, to say the least. Uh, I would like to hear uh, female voices read this story, uh, if we could do that. Do I, have a, do I have a female volunteer to read this part, please? Okay, so uh, feminist scholarship would already have a lot of problems with this. <clears throat> For one, they keep using the phrase son-in-law and father-in-law, but then the word concubine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's not okay. Right? Well, what should it be? Wife. Wife. Yeah. Um, the, so far, the story's about her, but does she have a name? No. Nope. And she's called a girl. She's called a girl. Okay, uh, does she have any lines in this play? No. Who has the lines? Men. Men. Okay, and the very first sentence suggests that we are in a civilized place or a pre-civilized place. Why? There is no king. Okay, another female voice, please, to read this one. Good. So the two men sat and ate and drank together. And the girl's father said to the man, Why not spend the night and enjoy yourself? When the man got up to go, his father in law kept urging him until he spent the night there again. On the fifth day, he got up early in the morning to leave. And the girl's father said, Fortify yourself. So they lingered until the day declined and until the day declined. When the man with his concubine and his servant got up to leave, his father in law, Okay, so this is a story about a lot of hospitality. 
okay? I love the phrase, fortify yourself. Yeah, some of us are getting real fortified these days. <laughs> fortify yourself. Yeah, stay. Oh, it's late. Don't you want to stay some more? But it also sort of feels like the daughter ran away for a reason. So where does she want to be? Home. Home. With her dad. Who seems like a pretty great guy, doesn't he? Yeah. Uh, and then the, the man, um, he keeps wanting to go, but he doesn't really have any good plans for when to go. He's sort of willy-nilly a little bit. Okay, another female voice. Okay, put on your feminist scholar hats. Does the concubine have any lines? Nope. Who does the male talk to about whether or not to spend the night in Jerusalem? Okay, so the servant has more, uh, at, <coughs> more agency than the concubine does. And they won't stay in Jerusalem. Why? Because they are foreigners, and they don't believe that they will be received well in Jerusalem. This is exactly what um, Ezekiel was talking about, right? <coughs> you become worse than Sodom, he said. Remember that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it feels like the donkey has more agency than the concubine does so far, right? Okay. So they push on to Gebeah. And then he goes and he sits in the square. Why is that important? Because I told you in the Sodom story, they also go and say, we'll spend the night in the square. And we'll be safe. And we'll be safe. And Lot's like, no, 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 no. You don't know what kind of crazy stuff happens after dark. This guy goes to the square in order for someone to take him in. These are not foreigners. These are supposed to be people close to him. Right? Uh, some sort of kin of kin of kin or something like that, right? And so in this, he's supposed to be well received, or at least he has an expectation that he will be well received. But what happens? Nobody takes him in. Nobody takes him in. Yeah. All right, one more voice. Yeah, please. Then at evening, there was an old man coming from his work in the field. The man was from the hill country of Ephraim, and he was residing in Dubai. The people of the place were Benjamites. Benjamites. When the old man looked up and saw the wayfarer in the open square of the city, he said, Where are you going, and where did you come from? He answered him, We are passing from Bethlehem to Judea, in Judea to the remote parts of the hill country of Ephraim from which I come. I went to Bethlehem in Judea and am going to my home. No one has offered to take me in. We, your servants, have straw and fodder for our donkeys with bread and wine for me and the woman and the young man along with us. We need nothing more, the old man said. Peace be, with, be, peace be to you. I will care for all your wants. Do not spend the night in the square. So he brought him to his house and fed his donkeys. They washed their feet and ate and drank. Okay, does he use any we language? Nope. nope. 
He really talks about himself a lot. No one has taken me in, he says. So far, other than the addition to some donkeys, if I just showed you this, you would think that we were in Genesis 19 and not Judges 19. You see how very closely similar it is to the Sodom and Gomorrah story. Yeah, yeah. Okay, another female voice. Y'all are afraid of what's coming next, aren't you? <laughs> you should be. Okay, thanks. While they were enjoying themselves, the men of the city, a perverse lot, surrounded the house and started pounding on the door. They said to the old man, the master of the house, bring out the man who came into your house so that we may have intercourse with him. And the man, the master of the house, went out to them and said to them, no, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Since this man is my guest, do not do this vile thing. Here are my virgin daughter and his concubine. concubine. Let me bring them out now. Ravish them and do whatever you want to them, but against this man do not do such a vile thing. But the men would not listen to him, so the man seized his concubine and put her out to them. They wantonly raped her and abused her all through the night until the morning. And as the dawn began to break, they let her go. As morning appeared, the woman came and fell down at the door of the man's house where her master was until it was light. How many of you have ever heard this story before? Just a couple, just a few, yeah. You see how very closely it parallels. I mean, the language is almost the exact same, right? Uh, don't take this man. Here are my two virgin daughters and his concubine, right? Uh, but the old man doesn't actually, doesn't actually put them out. But the, the man of the story does take his concubine and puts her outside the door so that these men can rape her. Now, you've all heard of Sodom and Gomorrah, but we do not talk about this story from Judges 19. And it for sure doesn't show up in our three-year lectionary cycle, right? <laughs> but I need you to know that this is not okay, and there are parts of our scripture that we need to openly condemn. Not just even know that they are there. We need to say these are not okay. This whole thing about how the Bible is perfect and the Bible doesn't contradict itself and the Bible is a guidebook gives power to people who offend like this. This needs to be openly condemned. This is not okay. This is not okay. This is not okay. Okay, somebody read this next part. This is just the happy ending. Yeah, good. In the morning, her master got up, opened the doors of the house, and when he went out to go on his way, there was his concubine lying at the door of the house with her hands on the threshold. Get up, he said to her, we are going. There was no answer. Then he put her on the donkey, and the man set out for his home. When he had entered his house, he took a knife, and grasping his concubine, he cut her into twelve feet limb by limb, and sent her throughout all the territory of Israel. Then he commanded the men to be sent, saying, Thus shall you say to all the Israelites, Has such a thing ever happened since the day that the Israelites came up from the land of Egypt until this day? Consider it, take counsel, and do it. Okay, there's a lot to unpack here. <clears throat> In the morning... She is on the threshold. She tried to get back in. Yeah. Then, does he say, oh, my love? What does he say? Get up. Get up. Get up. We are going. And first thing he says to her. And it seems like the first time we've ever expected her to respond to anything, and she is what? Dead. Unresponsive. Yeah. Feminist scholars like Phyllis Tribble, who's written famously on this in a book called Texts of Terror, which is fantastic. She says that we don't actually know if she's dead by the time he cuts her up. We only know that she's unresponsive. Um, 
Also happening here is that when he gets back, he commits more violence. He does not treat her sacredly. He does not give her a proper funeral. He does what? And sends her 12 body parts to the 12 corners of Israel, of which there are 12 tribes, in order to say what? You see how badly you treated me? That's what he's saying. You see how badly you treated me? And does he say in this text, which by the way is older than Genesis chapter 19, this story reminds me exactly of Sodom and Gomorrah. Does he say that? No. What does he say? Nothing like this has ever happened before. This is the original tale. This is the Pyramus and Thisbe to the Romeo and Juliet. This is the story that influences Genesis 19. Sodom and Gomorrah is a retelling of this tragic story, and Sodom and Gomorrah gives it a happy ending instead of a brutal one. This is a story of what chaos looks like when no one is willing to stand up for what is right. This is what a world looks like when we are all cowards, willing to preserve nothing but ourselves. And I wish I could tell you that that was an ancient story. Yeah. I wish you could too. But it's not. This story needs to be told. This story needs to be condemned. This story needs to be in our minds when we think about women and violence all over the world and stop pretending like it's not there and start speaking up for how uh, it needs to be corrected. At no point in this story does the man take any responsibility for his own actions. She runs away because he's having an argument with her, which... Phyllis Tribble will tell you, suggests that he was being violent to her. That's why she ran away. She ran all the way back to her father. And while there, her father protected her. Her father tried to get the man to stay as long as they could because he knew that was the best life for his daughter because he knew this man did not love his daughter the way that he loved his daughter. And then on the way home, because of some apparent slight... The man of the story decides he cannot stay in Jerusalem because they won't treat him fairly there. They go all the way to his folk. They go all the way to Gibbon so that he may be well received. But when he gets there, he's wrong. He doesn't use any of her alliances. He doesn't use any of her connections or any of her family, despite the fact that her family treated him very well. He passes the city of Jerusalem in order to find solace in a hometown for himself. And when he gets there, he's miffed that he's not well received. Finally, an old man who remembers the old ways invites him in. And then his concubine suffers a terrible atrocity and then dies. With no mourning and no remorse. And the only thing that seems to come out of it is more violence and a warning to all the other 12 tribes that this is as bad as it gets. Do you see how these are really stories about fledgling city-states that are trying to be hospitable for the first time? They're trying to do better, but they know that violence still happens. Genesis 19 and Judges 19 are civilizations on the brink. And whether or not you've ever studied Judges 19, these are uh, actual paintings from this. You, this one's really dark, but you can see her on the doorstep. Can you see her there? And then here she is on the doorstep. And he, like, he looks compassionate in this. They're reading into that text. Uh, and this um, is not the most brutal retelling of chopping her up at the end of Judges 19. Why would you expect him to be compassionate when he's the one that gave her the crowd? Yeah. Why would you expect him to be compassionate when he's the one that gave her the crowd? Yeah, I, 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 I don't really have an answer for you. Uh, but here it certainly looks like somebody's trying to retell it that way. 
Um, and, and in this, he's got a sad face on, um, uh, but it, it's, it certainly uh, reeks of violence, and, and I'm not really, I'm, what? Yeah, I, 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 think, I think this is a telling of how after he cuts off body parts, because the same face, I think this is the telling in one picture what's about to happen. He's going to take the 12 pieces of her to the other places. These are civilizations on the brink. These are civilizations that haven't learned what it's like to be there together. And even though we've got fancier cars and fancier clothes, we still have a lot of this in our narrative. Ultimately, and I'm going to finish up next week. I hope you'll be here next week because it's going to be a lot of fun putting all this together. Uh, the Cain and Abel, I think, is the story that the whole thing is really about. And we're really getting there. So come next week and bring a friend. Even if they haven't been to the rest of them, I think next week will be a riot. Um, and it will, be a, it will be a happier story than today. Uh, it will be a, a lot better. There is really a, a positive message in Genesis. I, I promise. If you just stick with me one more week. I might even wear a Santa hat. How's that? <laughs> These are stories of warning. All of the stories we've covered in Genesis are stories of relationships gone awry and we tell them so that we might learn from them without having to live them. That we might learn from the mistakes of others and not have to make them ourselves. Have you ever had that conversation with your children? Right? Well, Mom, you did all those dumb things when you were in high school. Yeah, and they were dumb. <laughs> and I don't want you to do them. Right? Why do you have to just I yeah, that's right. These are all mistakes that should be learned from. Can you see that? Can you start to see that now? Can you see how this prehistory is supposed to influence our today? We're supposed to tell these stories so that we don't have to repeat them. So, the question is does God have a temper? And I think it's fair to say that these people realize that life without God's favor is terrifying. There's a reason why we cling to those words of Psalm 23. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Now, if you've ever been around a shepherd, those rod and that staff was to beat the sheep above the head, right? And to keep them in line. But they're comforting because they felt like God was near them. And in that event, there's nothing more that we ask than Emmanuel. God be with us. To, to beat off the wolves, too. Yeah. Uh, positive and negative reinforcement. Does God have a temper? These people definitely thought so. The people who tell the story of Genesis definitely thought so. But they have more advice for us. And so I've decided that I would just leave you with this, and then we'll finish it up next week. But this is a really great reading from Hebrews that you've probably heard before. But it reminds us that Lot was willing to do something even when, even when it felt perilous. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. For by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. What if we started telling the story of Sodom and Gomorrah that way? Not just as a story of destruction. What if we told the story of Noah and the ark that way? showing hospitality. So, sisters and brothers in Christ, as you prepare to have visitors in your house over the, the Christmas season, as you prepare to entertain strangers, may you also look up and realize that they are also angels. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. Amen. All right, that's it. Come back next week and bring a friend. It'll be the last one of our series. So we'll see you then.